We're good at celebrating the saints and the successful. Speakers, authors, athletes, leaders, and pioneers. You've seen it. All of those doing the great things, and we tout their greatest hour. And while there's joy to be had there, when you really dig in, the Bible is God's ongoing story of outcasts and rebels, exiles and rogues. It's the underdogs and the rejects, the screw-ups, who catch a second wind. It's the story of rock bottom and running on fumes and white-knuckled wandering that finally finds a home. It's about seeing more than meets the eye. It's about getting off the bench and into the game. It's about finding life when everything is ruined and beyond repair. It's the pivots and adventure, a journey unknown and unforeseen to find your voice, to discover your calling, to know your name, to realize you're loved, that you have love to give, to own these gifts despite the doubts, to accept the rescue you never saw coming, to receive forgiveness that the world denied you. It's the story of an open door, an endless invitation, and offer as much for you as us, as it is for them, as it is for others. It's a full embrace, running with you, toward you, always. It's the story of a father who wants you back, just the way you are. He's relentless, ruthless in his pursuit to build you up, patient and persistent as you find your way back. This is the real celebration, the proclamation, that no matter the darkness, no matter the distance, not even death can stand between you and his love. Not even death can close that door. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. No claim on me. Come on. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. You'll pay. Come on. 
Saturday was silent Surely it was through But since when has impossible Ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment Is Sunday's empty tomb Since when has impossible Ever stopped you? Come on, all together! This is the sound of dry bones rattling This is the praise make a dead man walk again To open the grave, I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again This is the sound of dry bones rattling Oh yeah! That's what we're here to celebrate tonight. We're here to celebrate how the two greatest events in the history of our world made the impossible possible. It's great being able to celebrate that with you this weekend. You can be seated. That song was inspired by this passage of scripture, Ezekiel chapter 37, where God takes the, the prophet Ezekiel and gives him this vision where he takes him out to overlooking this valley. Of course, this valley is filled just with bones dry bones. And God asks Ezekiel a question. He says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? Can they come back to life? And before Ezekiel's very eyes, God brought those bones back to life. It was a picture of what Jesus would do several hundred years later when he rose from the tomb, giving us hope that this life is not all there is. We have so much more to look forward to. It is the foundation of our hope, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And every week here at CCV, we celebrate communion as part of our worship. 
And what that does for us is we eat the bread and drink the juice. As those things become part of our bodies, it's a reminder that those two greatest events are also the two greatest events of our life. They define us. They define our hope, our purpose, and our joy. And as we celebrate that tonight, for those of you that are new with us, we invite all followers of Christ to join us. We'll share some more instructions with you on your screens. But if you're new, there's no, no pressure for you to participate. But as we come into this moment right now, where in your life, where do you need the resurrection power of Jesus? Father God, we, our hope is in you. And God, we are so grateful God, that this life is not all there is and that there is the promise of life after death because Jesus, he came out of that tomb. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You've tried it your way, tried it their way, tried everything in between. You dug deep, thought hard, tried to do what just felt right, but nothing ever offered much of any light. Empty offers, bitter hearts, empty schemes and broken dreams. You've been chasing down desires you thought would satisfy, searching for something to make you feel whole and alive. Empty bottles, forged promises, empty schemes and broken dreams. You went down paths you never planned on, saw things you can't forget, placed hope in who you thought were friends but they're strangers just the same. Empty rooms, lonely nights, empty schemes and broken dreams. You're something you don't recognize. You're someone you don't know. Just looking for that open door that finally brings you home. Looking for the invitation, fullness of a life, of welcome arms and real embrace and space to truly be seen, be known. Just looking for that open door that finally brings you home. My name's Ashley, for those of you that are new, and I just wanna say to everyone here, I think God has some of you here to welcome you home. 
even those of you that walk in with kind of both feet on the brakes when it comes to faith, you kind of know who you are, you haven't really wanted anything to do with church or God or Jesus, and can we be honest, some of you are here just out of obligation. Uh, I, I, I get that, I've gone to movies out of obligation with my wife many, many times, you know? Some of you guys know what I mean. Some of you are here just because someone cute invited you, all right? You're sitting next to him right now and you're like, not really into church, but I'm into this person, so this is all right, you know? And so you're here and I'm glad you are. Um, for some of you, here's why you're here. You just made a trade-off, all right? You knew if you didn't show up to Easter services that with your spouse, you were gonna pay for it for the whole next week. So you just made a trade-off. One hour at church, which by the way, our services are always one hour, or a whole week of pain, I'll take the church thing, right? So that's why you're here. And I think you made a great trade-off, by the way, because I don't think you're here by accident. I don't. Actually, I think there's, there's something we can all agree on, maybe right up front. And here's what we could all agree on is that no one disputes if Jesus was real. Like he was a real person here on earth. And really nobody disputes if Jesus changed the world. They really don't. For example, there's no credible historian in history that's ever disputed if Jesus was real. No one. And they don't even debate if Jesus changed the world. Of course he did. I mean, I'll just give you one example. Why on earth do we call it the year 2021? Why does the whole world keep track of time based on BC and AD? Do you know what that stands for? It stands for before Christ and Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord. In other words, the only reason the whole world says it's the year 2021 is because it's 2021 years after the birth of one person, Jesus. That's how much he changed everything. That's undisputable. The only disputable thing is this. Come on. Can Jesus change your life? And I believe with everything inside of me, not only can he, he's been dying to. And that means no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, the message of Jesus, the message of Easter, what we celebrate today, is for you. But here's what I wanna talk about during our Easter message today. I wanna answer a simple question. Why is it that so many people miss out on going all in with Jesus? Why do they miss the message of Jesus and actually deciding to follow Jesus with their life? And I wanna talk to you about one big reason today. And to do it, we're gonna have some fun because if you haven't been to CCV before, we like to have a little fun. We can have fun in church, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an exercise with you to start, and it's based on research out of the University of California, Santa Barbara by some scientists and researchers who've really been doing some groundbreaking research on a certain topic. So I'm gonna introduce it to you, but I'm gonna show you a picture in just a minute, okay? And in this picture, it's a messy bathroom, and your job is to see if you can find the toothbrush. Think you can find the toothbrush? You gotta find it pretty quick, you ready? I'm gonna show you the picture, count of three. You gotta find the toothbrush, three, two, one. See if you can find it. Anybody see it? You see the toothbrush? All right, take the picture away. How many of you, just honestly, how many of you in the midst of the mess saw, saw the toothbrush right there? How many of you saw that? How many of you saw that toothbrush, right there. <laughs> Not a lot of you. A lot of you completely missed it. It's huge. How could you miss that in plain sight? Now I could show you about 10 other pictures that kind of show the same thing, but what researchers and scientists have been discovering, this is kind of groundbreaking research over the past 30 to 40 years, and this isn't my research, this isn't Christian research, this is just a thing thing research, okay? This is what we're discovering is what researchers are calling, this is their word, inattentional blindness. Not unattentional, inattentional blindness. Now what's inattentional blindness? It's the reason we miss things that are really, really big. Watch, Here, here's what it means. It's two reasons we miss things. One is because it's bigger than our expectations. A lot of you miss that toothbrush because it's bigger than you would have ever even expected, so you just kind of glossed over it. There's a famous video of, of some people passing a basketball and a gorilla walks on screen, and everybody misses the gorilla, why? Because it's just, you would never even expect him to be there. Just miss it. 
The second reason that we, we miss things is because our attention becomes too focused on something else. You zone in on something and you just miss kind of the big thing right around you. And what I believe is that many of us have an inattentional blindness when it comes to the love of God and what he came to do for you through Jesus. You missed it. You've been missing it. In fact, the very first Easter, did you know that there isn't one single follower of Jesus, the very first Easter, that saw what Jesus came to do? They completely missed it. All of them were blind. In fact, and this should give some of you that have kind of been skeptical of the Bible, this should give you incredible evidence that it's actually true. When Jesus rose from the grave over 2,000 years ago, his followers captured the story in the gospels we have today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you were making up a story, you would not write yourself into the story as blind. You'd write yourself into the story as a hero. And yet what we find is when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John capture the story, they all capture it as if they are completely blind to what Jesus was gonna do, even though it should have been 100% obvious to them. Let me just show you one example from the book of Matthew and just kind of let this sink in a little bit. Matthew chapter 16, these are the words of Jesus, says that from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples what, what he must uh, go to Jerusalem and he's gonna do what? Just look at the words. He's gonna suffer many things at the hands of the leaders. He's gonna be killed. Jesus says, I'm going to be killed. And then Jesus says, I'm gonna rise again on the third day. I mean, Jesus makes it crystal clear. Very next chapter, chapter 16, or 17 of Matthew, he says the exact same thing. He said that I'm, I'm gonna be betrayed. I'm gonna be killed. On the third day, I'm going to be raised again. Do you get it? They're all like, uh-huh. Matthew chapter 20, the last week of Jesus' life. Listen to how clear Jesus is, how obvious this is. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. That's where he'll be crucified. This is the last week of his life. On the way, he took all the 12, he said, come here, come here, come here. I've been telling you this over and over again. I'm gonna tell you one last time because it's getting ready to happen. Here's what he told them. I'm gonna be betrayed. They're gonna condemn me to death. I'm gonna be turned over to the Gentiles. That just simply means the Roman rulers at that time. They're gonna, watch how detailed he is. They're gonna actually flog me, crucify me. They're gonna mock me in the process. And then watch this. I'm gonna tell you again, on the third day, I'm actually gonna rise from the grave. Could it be any clearer? No. Guess how many of the disciples believed it would happen and thought it would happen? Zero. Zero. Not one single follower of Jesus thought he was gonna rise from the dead. In other words, on the first Easter Sunday, you know, when the sun's getting ready to rise, nobody's at the tomb with a group of people, sun's getting ready to rise, going like this. 10, nine, eight, seven, no one. Every single person was blind, even though Jesus made it so obvious why. Inattentional blindness. It was too big for them to comprehend that someone would come and die for them and rise from the grave. And secondly, their attention was focused on something else. They thought Jesus came to be a king and to give them all the prestige and power. They were butting up next to him. And when he died, all of them thought it was over. Do you know every single one of them when Jesus died? None of them thought he was gonna rise from the dead. They all were hiding in a room thinking the whole thing's over. And what I wanna to talk to you about today is how that exact same thing happens to so many people here today. Maybe you. You have blindness to what God wants to do in your life through Jesus. You've just missed it for really the same two reasons. I wanna to talk to you about two reasons many of us miss the message of Easter. And we miss it for the exact same reasons researchers tell us inattentional blindness sets in. Let me put it in words that maybe you can understand. Why do we miss it? Why do so many people miss it? Number one, we miss it because God's unconditional, remember that word, unconditional love, is so big, it's beyond our wildest imaginations. Come on, when you think about love and just how you experience love around you and in your life, it is so opposite 
from the love that God came to show you. Now just hang with me. Isn't it true that almost all the love and the relationships we have today, the love that we have for others and others have for us, it's conditional? There's conditions, in other words, we know when we give love to others, we'll receive it, and if we withhold love from others, the relationship's probably gonna fall apart. This is true with family, with friends, even in your marriage. In a marriage, we all know there's lines that if it gets crossed, the relationship probably falls apart. It happens over and over again, right? I mean, those, the people here today that should understand conditional love the most are those of you that own a cat. <laughs> you know it. You know it. You try not feeding that cat for a week and you see how much they cuddle up next to you all sweet. In fact, someone sent me this picture this past week I cracked up. It says, I'm not saying your cat doesn't care about you, okay? I'm just saying if Lassie was a cat, Timmy would still be stuck in that well. <laughs> and that's 100% true. Timmy would have died if Lassie was a cat, all right? See, I know, I know it's kind of a joke, but just, just listen. The love we have for people and people have for us, it's conditional. Not so with God. God's love for you is 1,000% unconditional, and he sent Jesus to die for you before you did jack for him. And that is so hard for people to wrap their minds around, that God would do something that, for them, which means someone needs to hear this today. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. God loves you unconditionally. Do you know if you are the last person on earth? Scratch that, you are the only person on earth that's ever existed. Do you know God would have sent Jesus for you? Just for you. It's as if God is the perfect father. And I don't know what your father was like when you were growing up. So many people, their, their earthly father kind of gets in the way because they didn't have a great relationship with how they view God the father. It's kind of messed you up a little bit. But just picture the perfect father. I'm a dad of three girls. And I would jump in a train. I would jump in front of a train for one of them. Notice I said one of them. One of them, okay? <laughs> well, my, my girls were in the front row last night and I looked over at them and they were like, is it me, Daddy? Am I the one? You know? Like, settle down, settle down, okay? I might even jump in front of a train for one of you. I really would, as long as you weren't a Seahawks fan. I will not do that, all right? No way. I don't care who you are. I would never throw one of my kids in front of a train to save you. I wouldn't. And yet God through his son in front of a train. He put him on a cross to suffer the most horrific death possible so that he could forgive you and show you the kind of love that you've never experienced in your life. And I'm telling you, that kind of love is so big that some people, maybe you, you've missed it. That's one people, that's, I'm telling you, that's one reason people miss going all in with Jesus. They just can't comprehend how someone would love them that much. Here's the second reason people miss it. The second reason is because our attention gets focused on everything but God. These researchers on inattentional blindness, they tell us that your visual focus is about the width of your thumb. That's, that's, your, that's the clarity of your focus. Every inch outside of the width of your thumb, things get gradually and gradually more unclear. So what have some of us done? We've put God way out here and we operate as if he doesn't even exist because we're focused on everything else. What are we focused on? You know what we're focused on because it's what maybe you're focused on. You're focused on making more money because you actually think that making more money will actually satisfy your life. You're focused on your work and your career because you think if you just get more prestige and you kind of work your way up the ladder that, that you'll finally have the satisfaction that you've been looking for, that emptiness will go away you feel at night. Many of us, what we're focused on is we're focused on more pleasure. 
We're focused on the next sexual escapade or the next trip or the next adventure or the next high, the next party. We're filling our lives with all sorts of things we think are gonna gratify and when none of those work, which by the way, every single one of those will put you flat, empty all the time and you know it because you're experiencing it right now. When, all, when none of those work, you know what we do? We turn to something destructive. We turn to a substance to try to numb the pain or a drug or alcohol or pornography. And if you feel empty, it's because you put God way over here. And then in the midst of all this, a pandemic hits. And you know what the pandemic did? And this is, by the way, a beautiful thing if you'll let it, let it be this in your life. The pandemic began to strip away those things that some of you began to put in place of focusing on God. It even began to strip away some of the coping mechanisms you had that you were using to push down the pain or issues in your past of maybe abuse or anxiety or depression. And those things began to get stripped away. You know what it did? It showed some of you that your life is empty without something. You don't even know what it is. What you're missing is God. What you're missing is Jesus and the love and forgiveness and purpose that he can bring to your life. And that's why I believe God has some of you here today to welcome you home. Maybe welcome you back to church because you've been away for a long time chasing other things. Maybe the pandemic just took you away. But more importantly, I think God has some of you here today to welcome you literally home, to finally decide to follow Jesus and go all in with your faith. And I wanna tell you exactly how to come home today because there's one door, there is one door that leads home. And I wanna tell you what that door is, but first I need to explain to you, there's a few doors that aren't the right doors. And unless you understand those, you won't really go to the right door. So just for a few minutes, let me just tell you three doors people try to walk through that never lead them home. These are three doors. And my guess is you might relate with one if you've been far from God. Here's the first door. I know it's not creative, but it's just the first door. It's the wrong door. You ever, you ever walked through the wrong door before? Like just walked into the wrong place? My very first job I worked at, I worked in this office building, but our company had multiple office buildings, and the, the office building I worked in, the men's bathroom was to the left, the women's was to the right. Somehow in another office building, they switched it. The men's was to the right, and the women's was to the left. So I went to the other office building, completely unsuspecting, super confident, walked in the bathroom. You know, guys, we just gri- grab our pants. We're gonna like get to business. I like looked up. A woman looked right at me and she's like, hello? <laughs> I was like, oh, and I just like ran so fast out of there. <laughs> I went through the wrong door. Listen, some of you are chasing the wrong things. It's leaving you empty. Here's what the wrong door is. The wrong door represents trying to find purpose in anything or anyone outside of Jesus. It's what we just talked about. You've been chasing everything else but God in your life because you thought it would satisfy you. And at some point you have to realize, you just have to come to a realization that there's nothing in this world that will give you purpose, joy, peace, satisfaction until you center your life on God, until you go all in. See, I believe that God designed every single one of us with a God-shaped hole in our heart. You were born that way, and you can try to fill your life with more money, more sex, more success, more stuff, another trip, a better house, looking better, working out. You can chase anything, and it will always leave you empty. It is only until you invite God into your life that you'll finally feel whole. It's the only way it works. You been chasing the wrong door? I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, if I find in myself a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, wouldn't the most probable explanation be that we were made for something more. 
than this world has to offer? Of course you were. I love John 3.16. It is really the, the epicenter of everything we believe about what God came to do for you. I just wanna read it for you out of the message translation. It says this, this is how much God loved the world. You need to put your name right there. This is how much God loved you. Chris, John, Nancy, Rebecca, Emily, Pedro, Francine, You ever realize that God loves you that much? He doesn't want you running through the wrong door? What did he come to do? He came to give his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. You're gonna destroy your life chasing the wrong door. But by believing in him, anyone can have a whole, a whole and lasting life. Have you been running through the wrong door? That's the first thing that never leads home, is running after anything but God. Here's the second. The second door is really the locked door. What does that mean? The locked door, I would describe this way. It's thinking the key to being good with God, like being right with God, being able to go to heaven someday, is my good works. And man, this trips up so many people because so many people think they're a Christian. They think they're good with God because they think they're a good person. I'm doing good stuff. That makes me right with God. Did you know it is the exact opposite? There's not one place in all of scripture that it says good people go to heaven. Not once. Did you know it says the opposite? I say it this way sometimes. Just let this sink in. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Good people do not go to heaven. If good people went to heaven, how would you ever know if you were good enough? I mean, how would you ever know if the scales, like you're like, well, if I'm 51% good, 51% good things, 49% bad things, I'm good. How would you ever know? That's an exhausting way to live and it's why so many of you are exhausted. It's like, you, you, it's like you're walking up to a door and you have a key and you think the key is your goodness and you keep trying to get in and unlock the door and it never opens and one day you're gonna get to heaven. If you think good people go to heaven, you're gonna get to heaven, you're gonna think that opens the key to living a life fully with God forever for eternity. In Matthew chapter seven, it says God's gonna look at some of us and say, I never knew you. Yeah, but God, look at all the good things I did. I never knew you. You never relied on my son Jesus to be forgiven. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Did you know God's perfect? And heaven's a perfect place, so only perfect people get to go to heaven? And it doesn't matter how many times your mama told you, you're not perfect. <laughs> and neither am I. Just ask my wife. Actually, don't ask my wife. You know, she's gonna like get all into things, you know. Listen to what the Bible says. Just let this sink in. James chapter two, verse 10. For the person who keeps all the laws, you are perfect except for one. You just broke one. You're as guilty as a person who has broken all God's laws. Why? Because God's perfect and every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And until we rely on the forgiveness that Jesus came to give, that's the only way you're made perfect is if Jesus forgives you. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. That's the verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. He didn't give you a key that's your goodness. God holds the key, and the key he can give you, and the key he can give you is grace. That's how you're made right with God, is by relying on the grace that only Jesus can give you. Most people don't read the next two verses in, after John three sixteen, but let me just read them for you. It says this. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger at you, telling the world how bad it was. God didn't come to accuse you, he didn't. He came to love you. He came to help, to put the world right again. That's why he sent Jesus. He goes on to say this, anyone who trusts in him, that's Jesus, is acquitted. That's the word forgiveness. You're forgiven, that's the way you're made right with God, the only way. So anyone who refuses to trust in him, that's Jesus and his forgiveness, has long since been under the death sentence. It's why you feel empty. You're dead inside. You're not that good. Why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one and only Son of God and what he came to do. You ever, you ever thought the key was your goodness? I hope today just God just wakes you up. Your goodness does not make you right with God. 
relying on Jesus and his forgiveness actually does. Let me tell you about the last door. And I really think this is the door that most of you are gonna relate with. It's called the slam door. The slam door is thinking God's ashamed of you and won't accept you because of your past. And some of you here today, you, you've messed up so bad in the past. You feel so guilty. You hold so much shame. You may, even know, never, you may have not even told anyone about it, but you just carry so much weight. And what you think is you think that if you ever approach God with all the messes you've made in your life and you ask to come in, that God would answer the door and look at you and look at all the shame and he would slam it in your face. And he would say, you kidding me? Are you joking with all the ways you've messed up in your life? Go clean yourself up first, then come back. And that's how some of us feel. And if you hear nothing else today, I want you to hear this. That is one of the greatest lies Satan has ever used to deceive people from coming to God. Because God is the exact opposite. Please hear me. God is waiting with open arms in the midst of all your mess, all your mistakes, all your past, no matter how bad it is. I don't care how bad it is. God went to a, Jesus went to a cross. God sent him for you. We went through the series called The Prodigal the last three weeks. It's God waiting with open arms for you to come home. And if you let shame keep you back, Satan has you exactly where, you, where he wants you to be because you think you have to clean yourself up first. You know not one person in scripture cleaned up their life before they came and gave their life to Jesus? Not one. It's the exact opposite. You'll never clean up your life until you give your life to Jesus. So everyone comes to Jesus with all their mess, all their pain, all their past, And then Jesus helps you clean up your life and have the life you've always wanted. And we reverse it. So you you, you think there's a slam door, there's not. I love how Tim Keller puts it. He's this really great quote. He says, to be loved and not known is comforting but superficial. He says, as he goes on, but to be known and not loved is our greatest fear. You think if someone knew all the things you've done, they'd reject you. (laughs) To be fully known and truly loved is well, that's a lot like being loved by God and it is what we need more than anything. Is it time to come home? How do you come home? It's an open door. The only way to come home to Jesus is to walk through an open door. It's a free gift and God's just waiting for you. In other words, he's been knocking. The only question is are you gonna answer the door? It's free. Revelation Chapter three, verse 20 says this, here I am, God says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and some of you are hearing God's voice today, and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they will be with me. What that verse is saying is that if you approach God, it's open. He's just waiting for you to open the door. And if you would open the door, you would find a God on the other side waiting with open arms to forgive all your sins and finally give you the life that you've always dreamed of. But it only comes when you walk through the open door and rely on Jesus. How would you do that? How would you do that practically? Let me just be really practical. Right after Easter, a group of people got together and asked the disciples, what do we do? We realize Jesus died for us, how can we be saved? And listen to what Peter said in Acts chapter two, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness, that's how you get forgiveness, the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God will come inside you and transform your life. But it's repenting and being baptized. Repentance is a change. You turn from doing things your way and you turn to God. And baptism is a symbol of you turning your life over to God where you go underneath the water, which represents Jesus' death. You come out of the water, which represents Jesus' resurrection, and that means you died to yourself and you come out a brand new person. That's how you are saved. That's how you walk through the open door. So here's what you have to do. God's inviting everyone to be forgiven and come home. It's a free gift. When you believe in Jesus, you have to believe what he did. You repent of your sins. You decide to do things differently and you're baptized. That's how you come home. 
And if you've never taken those steps, I think God's calling you to today. On Easter, the best weekend to make that decision. And I wanna show you the story of someone who made that decision on Easter and it changed their life. Watch this. Well, my story, you know, kind of begins in the army. The moment we landed down, there was mortar, fire, it was this explosion, and like your anxiety is just at 100% every single day. We were in a medevac unit, so we kind of got to see the worst of the worst. When you start seeing this stuff over and over and over again, like it, it makes you angry, you know? <laughs> and then we'd have a chaplain there that would tell us like, oh, come to church. And I'm like, why? What's the point? <laughs> like, do you know where we are? Like, are you paying attention to what's going on here? I would say, where's, where's God's love in here? Like, where's it at? So I, I, I was just very, like, angry at God. I hated him for what was going on around me. So what I did is I turned to heavy alcohol and drugs. I wanted to kind of numb that sensation, the fear, like, just the aggression, everything about it. I started off by me going to a doctor and getting pain pills. And I just started using all the time. Like, whatever you had, I was down. The word hope didn't mean anything to me. There was zero hope in my life. I, I kind of resigned to the fact that I would be on drugs for the rest of my life. So my wife was obviously at her wit's end. You know, we have, we have two small kids. So I checked myself into a rehab and then they tried to talk to us about God. And I was like, listen, like, if there's a God, he hates me. I hate him, he hates me. Like, that's where we are. Relapse once, relapse twice. And that's kind of what led us to Easter. I was trying to get on my wife's good graces again. And she was going to Easter service at CCV. And I said, I want to go. And she's like, why? You know, <laughs> you don't care. And I was like, no, I'll go though, I'll go and I'll listen. And so we went to Easter service. But the whole thing, from the beginning to the end, I just sat there and listened and didn't drown it out, didn't try to daydream, didn't try to fall asleep, nothing. And I listened to the entire message. It killed me inside, but everything just started to change. And I just felt like relief. I couldn't believe it. After that day, like, I felt the sense of hope that I, I can do this. Like, like, I don't like saying it, but it's like, God can help me do this, what I can't do myself. I couldn't get it out of my mind, though. Like, I really couldn't. And I tried, <laughs> but I couldn't. And then I, I'm like, I'm going to write Ashley. I really wanted to reach out to you and say you impacted my life for the better on Easter. I recently relapsed and it nearly tore my family apart. But your message Sunday brought me to tears with my wife. It gave me a sense of hope. I hate myself so much and then the hurt I have inside of me is so strong that I can't imagine anybody being able to relieve that. And then like the next day, Ashley's assistant said, hey, like thank you so much for your your email, Ashley read it, and he was touched by it, and he wants to get you in contact with someone. So uh, Mike Gunderson got in contact with me. He's like, hey, like, I was in, I'm in the military, you know, I go to CCV. But one of my first questions is like, how could God forgive that? Was I able to be redeemed? Am I able to start over? Mike just sat me down and goes, look, getting baptized isn't the finish line. Like, that's not the end of your journey with God. That's just the starting point. That's your launching point. Like, that's when you're gonna say it like, 
I give my life, my will over to you. And it, I was okay with that. I lived, you know, 30 something years in my own will and it, it didn't work. It crashed and burned, so. I was ready to not drive for a little bit. So, <laughs> I got baptized. I just cried the whole time, so. <laughs> It was awesome though, yeah. <laughs> so after I got baptized, I can honestly say, like, I have hope, I have peace. I'm starting to forgive myself. I feel like I'm becoming a better father, a better husband, a uh, better friend. Um, to think that God would send his only son though, in make him go through what he had to go through to forgive our sins. Like, that's a gift, you know? Like, especially with someone like me with my past, like, it's a gift and I don't want to waste it. Wow. It's a gift. It's a gift that some of you need to receive and the reason you haven't received it is it was just too big. It's too big of a gift. You didn't think you were worthy. But if you ever wanna experience peace and purpose in this life, it never will happen for you until you turn your life over to Jesus. And I just believe with all my heart that today is someone's day to make that decision, to go all in and to be baptized. You don't wait. It's not another day, it's today. Because you can't go another day in your life without Jesus and be satisfied, you really can't. And I wanna challenge you that if, if you've been putting it off, make that decision today. Because here's what God will do, God will change your life. He, he specializes in it, he'll take that marriage that seems crumbling, and he can turn it around. He'll take that addiction that you can't overcome on, by, on your own, he'll help you. He'll take the anxiety, the depression, the loneliness, the pain from your past, the guilt you can never forgive yourself of. God will change your life. And listen, I wanna challenge those of you that have been baptized as infants, I wanna challenge you to get baptized as an adult, to make the decision for yourself. That's the model of Jesus, he was baptized as an adult. I was actually baptized as a real young child, I actually got baptized again when, when I realized I didn't know what I was doing when I was a child. So if you were baptized as an infant, you can honor your parents and what they wanted to do for you, you can make the decision for yourself today. Some of you don't feel worthy. Listen, if you walk to your car, because you don't feel worthy and that's your excuse for not getting baptized, you're making a mockery of what Jesus did for you. He's here with open arms. Some of you are like, I can't even come prepared today. What are you talking about? We came prepared for you. We have a change of shorts, a shirt that says change because that's exactly what God will do in your life. We have a towel, we're ready for you. So after the service, if you know you need Jesus, you need to go all in, you've never really gone all in, you haven't really repented and been baptized, you head straight to the baptistry, and I just can't wait to see what God does in your life. I wanna give you a chance to make that decision today if that's you. Our band's gonna sing two songs. As we sing these, you just, you just answer this question, God, what do you want me to do? And whatever God tells you to do, you simply do it. You simply do it. You accept the gift. Let's sing together. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt We're singing about our King Jesus Can we lift our hands? give him our praise today. We see.
Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of
stay standing for just a moment. What's God telling you to do? You just do whatever God's telling you to do. And for many of you, that is to go out these doors, straight to the baptistry, and you change your life. You get baptized today. Listen, you can walk to your car, you can go home, the same person you walked in as. Or you can be baptized, you can walk away changed forever to finally have hope, peace, and purpose in life. And I'm praying that you do. So I'm gonna pray right now for those of you that need to make that decision, that's exactly what you do. And then our campus pastor is gonna come out and give you some instructions on exactly where you can go to get baptized. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for every person here today that knows right now that you're calling them to finally go all in, to follow you, to be baptized. Would you give them the courage and the boldness to not walk away the same person, but to give their life to you? And when they do, would they be confident that you can change them, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done? You're in the business of life change. And God, we thank you for what you're gonna do in people's lives. And all of us thank you for Easter. The hope we have in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of us said, amen, amen. Well, the thing we've been looking forward to the most this weekend is for those of you who are ready to take that step of baptism, we're so excited to be able to celebrate that with you. Like Ashley said, even if you didn't come ready, we have everything you need. If you don't know where our baptistry's at, just go right out these lobby doors, keep walking on the sidewalk, it's on your left. You can't miss it. Hey, next weekend we kick off a brand new series. It's gonna be great called Big Questions. We'd love to have you be back here next weekend joining us for that. Until then, I hope you all have an incredible Easter. Happy Easter.